For thousands of years, the native populations of the Western Hemisphere built great cultures, cities, trade networks, religions, and made an entirely unfamiliar world. Although the meeting between the Eastern Hemisphere and the West is hazy, we do know that the 16th and 17th centuries sparked an exciting adventure for many nations. The mystery of lush resources of the not-so-new world played into deep needs for conquest and exploitation. By the late 17th and 18th centuries, expansion exploded. Spain, Portugal, the United Kingdom, France, America, and Canadians, and more, all started colonies and industries. The Spanish reached all the way from the Arctic all the way up to Northern California. However, there is one forgotten player in the story, or at least in the story told by American education, and that's the mysterious Russian colonization efforts in the region. Welcome to my mini-series on Russian colonization in North America and the Pacific. There's a lot to talk about, but let's begin from the very beginning. In the early 1200s, the Mongols spread into modern Russian territory. Behind them, they left a trail of Khanates and Mongolian-influenced puppets. But as the Mongols lost their power, actors evolved. One of these actors was the Grand Duchy of Moscow, who stretched along much of modern northwest Russia. This eventually changed when Ivan IV gained power in 1547. Ivan IV, otherwise known as Ivan the Terrible, held campaigns against many of the nation-states around him. With their adoption of Byzantine culture and icons, they spread down to modern southern Russia then towards Novobirsk in the center, and by 1639, the Russians reached the Pacific. Ivan and the following Tsars had finally joined Moscow with the shores of the Pacific, securing Russia as a giant. But like any nation, this land was not enough. As a side note, when I say Russia in this series, it is referring to all forms of Russia. Russia had the Tsardom of Moscow, the Tsardom of Russia, the Grand Duchy of Moscow, the Russian Empire, and so on. So just know that there are many different governments, leaders, etc. involved in the politics behind the colonial efforts. And I'll make quick mentions of what was happening back in Moscow and Europe, but I'm going to focus on just the life and the expeditions along the Russian colonies in the Pacific and North America. Moving forward some time, Peter the Great in 1725 hired Danish explorer Vitus Bering, who was contracted to see whether Russia's eastern coast was directly connected with North America. He sailed around the North Kamchatka Peninsula and almost starved with his crew of 34. Eventually, he made it around the peninsula, confirming there was indeed no connection between Russia and North America. Now it was a race to see who could find America first. Nobody in all of Europe can answer how far this distance would be. Things remained quiet for the next 10 years. Many explorers tried their lucks in exploring for America. The mystery grew ever larger. Until the vessel Sovetoy Gerville in 1732, navigated by Ivan Fedorov and a few other explorers of the region, saw the modern-day Cape Prince of Wales. They mapped the area and the coast and returned back, never setting foot on the ground in North America. Unfortunately, Fedorov came so close to being the first person to travel from Russia to the Americas. That title surprisingly goes to the Dane, Vitus Bering in 1741. In 1741, Bering and Captain Chikarov landed on ground, this being their second voyage, also called the Kamchatka Expedition, and it was planned explicitly towards North America. There was a lot of politics in who was chosen, um, but a crew of 600 was set to colonize the coast. Many like Anna Ivanovna were selected for their prestige, and foreigners from Ireland, France, Germany, and many other different backgrounds were chosen for their abilities in creating colonies. This venture for North America was quite intense. A few ships were made for the expedition, and a few ships wrecked and had to return back up to port. There was even a few sailors killed by Russian natives. Anyways, information on the expedition is rather hazy, and is seemingly unreliable, so keep that in mind. Many of these stories were changed and covered by the Russian government, as dozens died, including Bering. To make a long story short, many boats crashed along the Aleutian Islands, and the explorers even landed on Mount Sailing Elias, the second largest mountain in North America. They seemingly were very confused. In many cases, they thought they had landed on the Aleutian Islands, and in reality, they landed up in the now southern border between Alaska and Canada, far from home. Eventually, 46 remaining colonists made a ship out of the wreckage and returned home. After this hiccup, this confirmed information that North America was close by and drove many Russians to seek fur trapping in a region already known to be rich in furs, as expressed by French and British trappers. Many of these trappers, known as Pramishleniki, made private colonies along the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. They made trading posts and hunting grounds. Pramishleniki were basically Eastern Russian peasants who were already familiar with Siberian hunting and made their living in Alaska. Many of these Russian trappers were Siberian, and similar climates made work relatively similar. If I die.
However, there was one looming issue. Labor. The Russians found the Aleuts, the native population of the Aleutian Islands and parts of Alaska, and these people were also fishermen and trappers. But the Russians needed more grain. Quickly it became apparent that these natives did not know the crop methods of Russia. Either way, the Aleuts, with words of riches in Alaska, were enslaved. Many Russians took Aleut families as hostage until the men gave them furs or other resources. Luckily, Catherine the Great stated that the Aleut people should be treated as equals. Although Catherine was in charge of an exploitative government, this news is rather nice. In this time, around 1763, many natives and Russians learned to live together. But of course, some natives were still treated very poorly. It was also during this era that many Russian Orthodox missionaries came over, and many Aleuts were made the godchildren of Russians, and many natives still practice Russian Orthodox in the region today, a tribute to this legacy of this weird, interesting connection. Over time, even more expeditions continued both sponsored by the government and from out of pocket. The colony was not exactly profitable. The cost of sending furs back was not worth what the hunters were putting in. Either way, this did not stop much. Many companies went to the newly founded area of Russian America. However, the animals were being killed faster than they could repopulate, and soon the Aleuts were developing more and more problems in supplying the Russians. Eventually, a Russian fur monopoly developed, known as the Shelenikov Golikov Company and it quickly swallowed the region, attacking natives for supplies and bullying their way towards success. Many natives, some 80%, also died of disease, and even Catherine recognized the company as the only company for the region, although she did deny them full control over the colony. This company developed into the Russian-American company, which practically had total control over the colonial efforts in the region. The leader, Shelikov, attacked Kodiak Island with two ships, killing hundreds of natives and enslaving the rest. There was already a Russian colony on the island, a center for trade in the region, on Alaska, but either way, he turned the Three Saints Bay into a new hub of trade. This information is hazy, but either way, Three Saints Bay became a new foothold in the region and showed the dominance of the Russian-American company towards natives. This city no longer exists, but remains a national historic landmark in the United States. Eventually, the trade hub would evolve into its permanent residence of Kodiak. This was managed by a friend of Shelikov, Alexander Baranov. This residence remained and still remains an essential port for Alaskan trade. Many Russians took native wives and continued the killing and integrating of the local populace. Not all hope was lost for the Alaskan natives, though. There was one group that posed a threat, the Tinglet, or Koloshi in Russian. They responded by attacking newly built Russian outposts that aimed to challenge the Tinglet's trade networks with other European colonialists. Eventually, the Russians came back and leveled the village that organized the raid. The place attacked, Mikhailovsk, was rebuilt as New Archangel which refers to another city I've also mentioned on this channel. Anyways, this turned into Sitka, another major modern city in Alaska. The continual depletion of local resources and conflict with the natives would continue to grow, and the conflict with the Twinglets would unfortunately climax at the Battle of Sitka, which we'll start off in the next video. Before I close, here's another fact. The Spanish also entered Alaska. From the 1770s all the way to the 1800s, Spain took their shot at fur trapping and colonizing here. But most of these plans for Spain that reached from Argentina to Alaska were stopped by the Nootka Crisis, which deserves a whole video on its own, but was basically a conflict between Britain sailing ships in Spanish Alaskan waters, and the French and Spanish expected to fight the British and Dutch for the territory. But they eventually talked it out. Even the Americans were involved. The entire Spanish conflict on the West Coast caused Spain to be outcast by the world. They basically violated the rule that you need a settlement to claim territory. Weird stuff and there's a lot more politics to it, but hope you enjoy this information and the video itself. I know this video is not about war or something like action based, but I still hope you enjoyed because I think this is really interesting stuff and it's barely even covered on YouTube. So maybe in a few years, somebody will look up why did Russia own Alaska? Um, so make sure you join the discord and expect more content, maybe similar content, maybe different content very, very soon. Thank you for watching.